Hi, uh, this is Troy Teeples with ReadyPreppers.com. I'm here with David Gilmore, and he's going to be sharing with us today how to build a no-cost garden. No cost, right, David? No cost. Four sticks and two strings. Wow. Very excited. So let, let's go ahead and get started with how to build a no-cost garden. Let's do it. What we're going to do here is we're going to continue talking about the Midnight of Gardening method and how to grow, uh, how to build a garden at no cost. And when I say no cost, I mean zero dollars, no pennies, no cost, <laughs> absolutely free. Now the reason why I'm taking the time to talk about this is because the day will come, and I believe sooner than later, where people will turn to you and say, you have an amazing garden, can you help my family? Uh, we, we've got to take, we got to take our lawn out and we need to grow some food. You'll be able to tell them very quickly and easily how to do this. I would encourage you uh, to laminate this sheet or put it into the sheet protector. Uh, if you want a next one for doing that and you want to take notes on this one, that's fine. I have extras here. That way you have it and you, can, you don't have to try to remember what we're telling you. You can actually show it to them. You will be able to save lives by telling them how to quickly and easily in the same day take a lawn out and plant their vegetables. And that's what we're going to talk about. What we're going to talk about first of all is the man who developed this system because he deserves the time for us to honor him and respect him for what he's done. Jacob Bentleyer spent 55 years of his life in developing countries, 27 countries specifically and helping them from starvation. He saved millions of lives from starvation. And, uh, and this is how they did it. They did it in the dirt. No soil amendments, no compost, no manure, no mulch, no straw, no stink, no mess, no cost, and everything grows fantastically well. So let's, let's talk about this. Jacob Mintleiter uh, was known for his um, expertise in, in growing flowers. Uh, when Jake was 47 years old, uh, he was getting about four hours a night asleep. Uh, he was very well known, very well respected, and very well rewarded financially for his expertise in flowers. He had 11 plant patents. I can't imagine anybody with 11 plant patents. I know nobody else with 11 plant patents. This guy was a plant genius. Uh, on his deathbed in the hospital, he had a conversation with his Lord and said, if you'll give me some more time, I'll do what you want me to do. And he spent the rest of his life until his dying day uh, helping other people grow food. How much more longer was that curious? 47 more years. 40, so he died at what? In his 90s? He was, uh, yeah, well, 47 plus 47 is 94. Wow. There is something to eating your eating vegetables, right? He was a practicing Seventh Day Adventist, so that means he ate a lot of vegetables. Um, so he he uh, he went to the Seventh Day Adventist and said, "I'm here to teach people how to grow food. I know how to do it. And where can I go?" They said, "How about we send you to where the cannibals live?" So they sent him to, I believe, it was Papua New Guinea. These are the cannibals that were there. This is the photograph that he took when he was there. They were eating each other. Oh. Okay? The tribes would war. The winning tribe would eat the other tribe. All right. So one thing was happening with these, with these guys is they were all dying from a disease. Like mad cow disease. Mad cow disease. Yes. And so the military came in at, a, at the end of a gun and said, all right, no more eating each other. 90% of them had mad cow disease, which turns your brain to mush. There is no cure. It comes from animals eating animals. Now, back then, it was common practice for the commercial livestock growers in the United States to take their dead and dying but not dead animals and grind them up into the food for the next generation's feed. Chickens even. So, 
right then, Jake decided no animal products in the garden. No chance of getting mad cow disease. So um, what they were doing, once they had to become you know, growers of food, they started growing. This was called, uh, this is the food, and this is the weeds. Does this look like somebody's garden you might know? <coughs> They're growing produce in between the weeds. This was called the devil land. They gave him the worst land to grow on. Uh, the, in one season, he turned it to that. Full of produce. This is what they were living off of. These, this is, these are the men that were in that first photograph. Okay? These are the cannibals. These are the, the uh, sugar beets that they were growing. In one season, they went from this malnutrition, uh, uh, skinny little plant and people to this. By properly, but with no compost, and they were using manure and compost and mulch and all that, or you know, normal stuff that people use in, in poor countries who don't know better or have better processes. And in using an all natural mineral fertilizer that Jacob developed, uh, clearing the land, get rid of the weeds, in one generation, he was able to take this, the, the, the plant growth off of these and grow these plants. These are the children of those plants. He didn't bring in any new crop. These are what you do when you grow, when you feed your plants properly. He had a 40 time percent increase in production, not 40 percent, 40 times, simply by taking care of um, how, how they grew. The school that they were helping these, uh, in Papua New Guinea, uh, helping these students, they were shutting it down because they could not grow enough food for the, the school students and the um, faculty. They are now making net $120,000 a year in Papua New Guinea. Do you realize what $120,000 a year in Papua New Guinea does every year? This school, 30, 40 years, however long it's been, is still growing and is still profitable. Okay? So when I have some respect for Jacob Midlider, it's deep respect. Um, in Zimbabwe, a student named Ken, or Kenneth, this, uh, this is when he was developing his Midlider garden, and this is the garden. He went from uh, average of $80 a year to within the first six months, $580 net profit in his first six months. Can you imagine going to uh, more than doubling, more, more than 10 times, almost 20 times your income in a season? You know what was cool about Ken? As he went around and he taught 80 other students to do the same thing. He paid it forward. Now, not all the growers did that. Some growers become multi, multi, well, let's just say extremely wealthy. And they wouldn't tell anybody what they were doing. That's not what we're doing here. We're, we, we are paying this forward, trying to get everybody to grow food. This is uh, Ken growing organically, and this is him growing the midlater method. Here's the growing vertically here. Um, lots and lots of produce. You think you have bad soil? Leachy clay, that's what we had in Houston. Awful. And I think my, my soil in Idaho falls down. Houston. In I, I lived in Arizona, that's where my dad had his, his garden. Terrible, terrible soil. From here to there, in one season, all right? No matter where you are, what kind of soil you have, you can transform it into a, a food producing forest. Yes. What, what is plastic? Thank you for asking. I have two requests, and that is, uh, ask any question. If I don't, if I don't see your hand, wave it. If I don't see it, stand up and wave it. If I don't see you, say, David, I got a question. All right. I want to make sure every question is answered. You're David. I'm David. Okay. <laughs> so the second request is, um, I will not interrupt your conversations. So if you're talking, I will not interrupt. So. Because uh, everybody wants to hear what everyone's saying. We only need one person to say. In uh, here, 
in, uh, I forget where this was, in Columbia, I believe, it had torrential rains every day. The plastic just keep the rain off the plants from washing out. They didn't need it to keep the sun off or to keep, you know, keep it warm. It was to keep the rain off. And that's one thing I used in, in Texas was this over my garden year round to keep the rain off. I actually have a video of it just raining cats and dogs. And uh, I actually had sides on mine. At, but during the rain time, I had it up because I didn't need it. It wasn't windy. But it was raining really, really hard. And my garden didn't get flooded. I always completely flooded. The growing area, no. You don't have any place? I hear this all the time. I don't have any place to grow. You know what? If you're, if you're living off your garden, you will find a place to grow. This is Okinawa. No place to grow. We're talking no place. They bury their, they stack their dead. They, yes, they cremate them and they stack them. There's no place to grow food. Yes, there is. They took a parking lot on asphalt, took two by eights, filled with sand and sawdust, and grew food. Uh, they were so impressed that the president of agriculture and their, the uh, commanding general officer for the U.S. Army honored Jacob Midlighter in a special ceremony, thanking him to show people how to grow food. Uh, he is taking away all the excuses for not growing food. I used to live in Okinawa. My dad was in the service. And they had rice paddies where our buses went to the school so they were growing rice. Everywhere they can. Yep, everywhere they can. So in the cities, there's no space. So out in the country, yeah, like in China, I've been guaranteed you don't want to eat any food in China. I've been to China. <laughs> Do not want to grow eat food from China. But anyway, so yeah, out in the country they would is where they'd have the agriculture. But in the city where the people live, they didn't have space, so they used that they used a, I think this is a, a raised like a two level, three level car garage. They took the top level and, and made the grow boxes. How about fifty three degrees north latitude? Where are we here? What latitude are we? Forty five. Forty five. Close. I'm at forty seven in Idaho Falls. All right, this is 53. This is Russia. You think we have winters here? <laughs> they were growing seven vegetables when he got there. This was the dacha, the garden area that they gave him. It was so terrible, he had to dig a trench to drain it. This was the worst piece of property. Yeah, sure, show us how to grow food. Good luck, go for it. In uh, one season, they were growing 21 vegetables. Vegetables that they had never ever seen. Well, they're like Alaska. Alaska one where they it's like Alaska. They have more more sunlight. They have more sunlight in the in the summer. Yeah, yeah. But the growing season so short, they they could only grow fast growing vegetables. So they were growing stuff for borscht, you know, cabbage, and things like that. Beet. Here they're growing. Yeah, here they're growing zucchini and beans and plants that they never saw. If you notice in the back here, these are all little 18 inch growing. Flats. These are seeding flats. They would start, he, first thing you do, he'd build a greenhouse. We talked about that in the last presentation. Uh, he would build the flats and he used them really for a seedling house. And he'd get the seedling started. Uh, once they get so big, he'd take them out to the garden, put the cover over them. Remember, we're growing food as if our life depends on it. He didn't skip a beat, he did everything exactly the same. And he, because he was able to extend the gardening season so long, they were able to get harvests that they had never, ever seen before. Okay, so what's your challenge? Complete blow sand? 100% blow sand. I have sand in my soil. Okay, this is down, uh, this was down in the Four Corners area. Uh, the, uh, this is down here, and this is the St. George area, I believe. Um, these people said, we're going to put in a midlife garden and, the, garden, and the ward members laughed them to scorn. You can't grow a garden here. It's just sand. Okay? There's, you can't grow anything here. Is that plastic? Maybe you can't grow anything here. This is what she harvested. She's taking it to the market. Okay? If you follow the laws that we talked about previously, you can grow anything, anywhere, anytime. So what does it take you need to do? You can just start, th this was all lawn. This was all somebody's backyard in Idaho. They converted to a food factory. This was a lady in um, Alaska with her cabbage in a midlife garden. 
Okay, so when we're talking about food production, we we talking about growing as much food as, in as small as, as amount of space as possible. Let's take a look at here at beans. If we're going to grow bush, grow bush beans, uh, we're and I'm going to I'm going to walk you through this chart. This is a very very important chart. <coughs> it's in the book. Okay, uh, you can plant either seeds or, or seedlings. Uh, it's frost sensitive. So you, do, you want to plant it on the average day of last frost. So in Idaho Falls, that's uh, you know Mother's Day, Memorial Day, June, somewhere around there. Unless, what? You're Unless you're extending it by using the, the mini A-frames and the mini, the mini greenhouse, yes. Then you can go earlier, up to six weeks earlier, okay? You're gonna have um, three inches apart. You're gonna space the seed three inches apart in two rows for the bush beans. You're gonna plant them half an inch deep. The rule of thumb for planting seeds is four times the seed thickness. Not the length, not the width, the thickness. So a pea is gonna go about down to my first knuckle. That's about four times the thickness of a pea. Lettuce, you're just gonna kinda of scratch little indent in the soil, aren't you? All right, and then you're gonna cover that with sand. All right. You'll harvest about 68 pounds of beans in a 30 foot by 18 inch row. You'll plant 240 plants. You'll fertilize about five to six times. We're gonna fertilize, this is important, and it's in the book, but you're gonna fertilize once the plants have germinated, you'll start your weekly feed, and you're gonna fertilize up to three weeks before harvest for a single crop, like a cabbage, all right, I'm gonna pick you in about three weeks. You stop fertilizing, because there's enough nutrients in the soil that it will keep growing. So you don't need to keep feeding it up to the last day, is what we're saying. If it's a multi-harvest crop, like tomatoes, uh, indeterminate tomatoes, where you're, getting, you're, you're harvesting for 16 weeks, you're gonna fertilize up to eight weeks before the average first day of frost in winter. So whenever that is in your area, November, of whatever it is, okay? So up to eight weeks. Does it say that on the chart? Um, it doesn't, but it does say that on the book. I'm sorry, but that's a good thing for the chart. I don't know if you have the space for it. Uh, the plant height will be about 20 inches. Uh, you can plant indoors. This is even gonna tell you when, you, if you're gonna start seedlings indoors, it'll tell you when to do that. Two weeks before you plant it, right here, minus two. Plant in the garden on the average day of last frost. Um, it'll take about 65 days to mature, and you're gonna have about a three week harvest period. Now this is the difference between growing vertically and growing bush tomato, uh, bush beans. In the same area, we're gonna uh, plant the, the seeds two inches apart instead of three inches apart. We're gonna plant one row, not two rows. We're gonna plant them in the same depth. We're gonna harvest not 68 pounds, 180 pounds pounds in the same square foot area. We're gonna not plant 240 plants, we're gonna plant less. We're gonna plant 180 seeds. We're planting less plants and getting more food. The reason is, and we're gonna fertilize uh, longer because they will continue to produce. Binding plants produce and produce and produce up to 16 weeks. So that's what exactly what we have found in our garden. We are growing bush beans and we're growing pole beans. We have been harvesting the pole beans for, I don't know, over a month. Eat well, well over a month, two months probably. The bush beans are coming on now. We've been harvesting for a couple weeks. And so we get in a couple more weeks in the bush beans and then they'll be, they'll be done. And the pole beans will keep producing and producing and producing, all right? So it's up to you how you want to do that. If you want to grow the bush beans, then when you think, okay, I'm gonna be picking those out in about two weeks, that's when you wanna plant your other seeds to get them started. And so when you take out your bush bean plants because you've already harvested, you've got plants to put back in the garden, so you're immediately uh, off to a big start. Yes? Can you comment about seeds? Yes, um, great question. There are three kinds of seeds, basically, that that uh, people know of and that are um, 
first kind is not available to you and me. And that's a genetically modified seed, a GMO seed. In order to get a GMO seed, you need to be a commercial grower and you need to have a contract with Monsanto. So you're not going to go to Walmart or Home Depot or online and buy a GMO seed. Uh, genetically modified means that they have sent, done something on a cellular level to that plant. Generally, it's an herbicide or a pesticide. So, for example, if they want to stop a worm from eating their crop, they will, on a genetic, genetic level, put in BT, which is organic bacteria, which is harmless to you and me to eat if it's on the leaves of the plant or on the fruits that we're eating. In addition, if you're spraying BT in your garden, when you harvest your garden, you're just going to wash it off anyway because you're washing your fruit and your vegetables. It's not an issue. When you put BT in the plant on a genetically, on, on a uh, cellular level, it's in every cell of that plant. You will eat it in every cell when, that you're eating from that plant. That is a genetic, genetically modified plant. You decide whether you want to eat those. Right now, about 70 to 80 percent of all the pro, uh, product, packaged pro, uh, uh, um, packaged pre-made foods in the grocery store are genetically modified, made from genetically modified plants. Americans typically eat hundreds of pounds of GMO of uh, GMO foods, not not hundreds of pounds. They typically eat hundreds of pounds of glyphosate each year, which is Roundup, which is what they put inside of a GMO plant. The Roundup is an anti, is a registered antibacterial. Okay, so when you're eating Roundup ready plants, because you're eating something that has high fructose corn syrup, or soy, or uh, corn chips, or whatever, uh, you're eating that that Roundup is what you're eating, hundreds of hundreds of pounds of it every year, and you're killing the bacteria in your gut. If you have no bacteria in your gut, you're getting no nutrition from your food. You decide what you want to eat. We prefer eating 90, 95% of our, our, our meals from our garden, where we don't use herbicides or pesticides, and we know what is or is not put on the vegetables. Yes? Um, I've read that uh, some countries in Europe have banned GMO. Many countries in the, in, around the world have Banned will not allow genetically modified seeds or pr uh, food, processed foods in their in the country at all. Yes, and those governments are are um, I think have made a wise decision. Let's put it there. There are handouts and contact cards. You just, you just make sure you get those. All right. So the other two kinds of seeds uh, is a, one is a hybrid. A hybrid is not a genetically modified seed. I am a hybrid. You are a hybrid. My father and my mother made me. I'm not exactly like my father, which is to my chagrin. I wish I were. He's a great man. And I'm not exactly like my mother. I'm a hybrid. What I am is hopefully the best of my dad and the best of my mother. So a big beef tomato, which is my favorite indeterminate tomato to grow, is a hybrid. They have taken traits from this tomato variety and traits from this tomato variety, which are both heirlooms, and they combine it into one plant. So this plant may be drought resistant, and this plant may be disease resistant, and now I have a drought disease resistant plant. That's a good thing in my book. The second thing I like about hybrid is that on average, they will produce three times the amount of food that a non-hybrid plant will, will grow. So an heirloom plant who is not necessarily disease resistant and um, drought resistant or bug resistant or whatever will generally produce one third the amount of food in the same plant, in the same space. The advantage of um, uh, a hybrid is it produces more food, it's more uh, disease resistant and insect resistant and drought resistant 
and it, the seeds generally cost less than high, uh, heirloom seeds, depending on what you're growing. The advantage of an heirloom is you can take that seed from that plant, like the sugar snap pea, and grow another sugar snap pea. It's, it's not a hybrid. You'll get the exact same plant every time. Now, my uncle, uh, who lives in Idaho, was on the team who developed the sugar snap pea. It was a hybrid until it had seven generations of the same plant. And when you have seven generations of the same plant, it now becomes an heirloom. That's all it is. There's nothing magical to it. When it's a stable, you get the same thing every time, then it's an heirloom, right? So what do we plant? What kind of seeds do we buy? We buy heirloom and we buy hybrid. My favorite beet is an heirloom, Detroit, a Detroit dark purple beet. It's an heirloom. Do we save the seeds from it? Nope, never. We have over 200,000 seeds in our seed banks. We keep our seed banks either in the dark, darkest, deepest, coldest place in the, in the basement or in the freezer, which is best. Every six degrees colder is a year longer for the seed. Now, never throw seeds out unless you've set, kept them in the window in the garage on the south side all summer long. Your germination, your germination rate is going to be pretty low. God has set a trigger in the seed, so when it's 70 to 80 degrees, that seed is going to want to germinate. And if there's light and there's humidity, that's going to start germinating, and then you haven't planted it right. So when you go to plant it, it's not going to germinate. It's dead. Keep it cold, dry, and dark. Keep it in the freezer. And you'll have seeds that'll last 20 years or longer with 95, 97% germination rate. You have old seeds, they may germinate. Keep them for your neighbor who hasn't bought any seeds yet. <laughs> All right? And let them play with that. What did you say the temperature was for seven? Germination is between 70 and 85 degrees. Oh, we so germinate. You want it below that. What's that? You want to store it below 70. You want to start, store it at freezing, in the freezer as cold as possible, yes. So if you've stored it just in your home, not necessarily in the freezer, what's your germination rate if it's a couple years old or a few years old? Hard to say, but it won't be 100%, but I would not throw those seeds away. You probably still have a fairly well germination rate. Um, I would <coughs> probably plant, if you want 10 whatever, why don't you plant 15 seeds, okay? And then you'll know, and then you'll know for the next time. Yes. I've heard there's some people that are trying to have plants that don't produce seeds that you could use to plant and make more plants. So they're trying to corner the food line. Yes. Is that true? That's genetically modified. Yes. That's exactly true. Is it yes. Genetically modified different than hybrid then? Yes. Yeah. I just I just went over that. So hybrid is fine. No, I'm just looking confused about hybrids. Do you take seeds from them and keep uh, growing them? First of all, I don't take seeds from any plant and keep growing them. I do not grow seeds. I buy seeds. I can buy seeds for a tenth of a penny, all right, and have them stored in my freezer and grow food. If I'm growing, if I'm growing lettuce and I want to harvest that lettuce seed, that means that whole lettuce plant is going to go to waste and it's taking space in my garden where I could be growing food and it's taking longer in the garden because it has to grow and then grow old and then grow seed and then I harvest the seed. Before, it ever harvest, before I can ever harvest the seed, the plant has gone uh, weak, it becomes uh, uh, susceptible to disease, it attracts the bugs. You see the cycle? So if I am wanting to grow seeds, I will have my seed growing area out of my garden in the seed growing area. I'm not planting, I'm not growing food there. But when I grow lettuce, I harvest my lettuce, and then the day I harvest that lettuce in the morning, it, that comes out and I'm putting the new lettuce in that hole, or cabbage, or beet, or whatever it is. But Would I'm not gonna wait. Pre-plant stuff. And I do pre-plant. 
But, and uh, so maybe I get with you and find out where you're buying your seeds. Uh, so where do we buy the seeds? Anywhere from a reputable seed source. If you recognize the name and you know it's a reputable seed source, then and you know that they're a certified seed grower, that means they uh, have to pass inspections where then they're not growing mold and funguses or diseases on their seeds, and you're not getting those in your garden. Do I trade seeds? Never. I never trade seeds. Not even for my good neighbor who says, my, this is my great, great grandmother's favorite tomato. I don't do that. If I were to do that, I would follow the information. Now, I don't do that because I have hundreds of thousands of seeds of the varieties that I want to eat. So I already know what I want. But if they're going to trade seeds, <coughs> then follow the instructions in the Middle Atlantic Gardening Course book on how to get rid of the diseases and the bacteria or the funguses on the seeds by going through the, the heating process, where you're not killing the seed because you're, you're making it too hot, but you are killing the fungus or bacteria. How much fungus. space in your freezer? What? How much space in your freezer? For um, all the seeds. I'm just curious. It doesn't take, you know, prop, well, we have them in the basement, in the coldest part of our basement, because we have too many seeds for our freezer. Right. And then we, as we open up a package, we'll put those in the freezer uh, to kind of keep those, because we've opened the package. We seal the package back up because there's still seeds in it. So we have seeds in the freezer, we have seeds in the refrigerator, and we have seeds in our basement. <laughs> it depends on where we are and just, using them. And just, okay. We have them everywhere. <laughs> yeah. In response to the hybrid also, if you take the seeds from a hybrid, you're not sure what plant it's going to grow because it's going to take from the one seed or the other seed that were combined. You know, you don't know what end thing, but if you have the heirloom, then you're going to get exactly the same thing all the time. Right. And, so, and I've also heard that it, heirloom seeds are going to be harder to come by. They are going to be harder to come by. That's absolutely true. So if you want to um, buy seeds that you can harvest seeds from, then I'd encourage you to get your heirloom seeds as soon as possible. If you want to, but I would encourage you, uh, how many of you like kale? Well, yeah. sure. About yeah. half of you. I've never tried it. Okay. If you can buy heirloom kale seeds and you don't like kale, don't buy them. <laughs> buy seeds that you want to eat, that you know your kids will eat, you know, that you're going to grow from. That's what I, that's my rule of thumb. It's good for you, but it's we, well, I have kale almost every day of my life, Put it in smoothies. and I have it primarily in smoothies with some fruit. Yeah, right. with sweet right. stuff. So what I'm saying is don't be afraid of GMO because you can't get it. It's not available to you. And buy either heirloom or hybrid, whichever you want, but buy what you're going to eat and what you're going to grow and get a lot of seeds. So do you find, do you have a list of, do you publish a list of seeds that you personally use and you found better than that's a great question. Are there a list What's of the seeds? Question? I'll, I'll, oh, I'm sorry. Is there a list of seeds that I have personal experience that I know that works well with the Midlatic Gardening Method? The answer is there is not a list, but there is not a single plant that doesn't grow well in the Midlatic Gardening Method. But I have had experience this season with two pole beans, and I'll share that with you. Okay? Uh, some people love uh, Blue Lake pole beans because of the flavor, the texture. And so do we. Uh, so I always plant different varieties of uh, plants. Like I'll have four different varieties of tomatoes growing. I've got two different varieties of beans growing to see how they grow. Because my life isn't dependent on it right now, right? So I can do a little bit of testing. So I grew Blue Lake uh, pole beans this year. And two inches away, right, I grew my Kentucky Wonder pole beans. Blue Lake or uh, Heirloom, Kentucky Wonder is hybrid. It's a hybrid to, uh, for uh, disease and insects. Um, my Blue Lake pole bean was, show, was showing me symptoms of magnesium and calcium deficiency, and I was giving it magnesium and calcium, magnesium and calcium, magnesium and calcium, a weekly feed, and it was I was spending all this time and effort in putting the nutrients into the into the plant and I'd see the deficiency come on, I'd give it the nutrients it needed, the deficiency symptom would go away, come back, I'd give it again, 
So it's consuming a lot of resources here. <coughs> what, what were you right? using it to give that? Uh, Epsom salts and oh, gypsum. Okay. okay. Right next to it, two inches away, literally, I've got Kentucky wonders that are perfect, perfect beans. Deep, dark, beautiful leaves, full of beans. Uh, it was about a month into growing my Blue Lake beans that they became completely, and I mean completely, covered with thousands of aphids. The plant was always under stress. It always needed more nutrients. I was trying to keep up with it. But you know what? I'm not running an ICU for plants. And so I will give a plant a good shake, but if it doesn't come out of it, it's coming out of my garden. There was literally not an aphid on my Kentucky Wonder Leaf. Not an aphid. I took the Blue Lake uh, beans out, threw them in the garbage, put the lid on it, and put it to the curb. And, I, and that was the end of my aphids. So, am I gonna grow Blue Lake whole beans again? I'm not. That's just me. I like Blue Lake whole beans, but for the amount of effort, and they produce literally less than a third of my, my Kentucky Wonders. My Kentucky Wonders are still in my garden, and they're still producing. I was harvesting Wednesday morning before I came here. All right? So that's my experience with that, you know, couple different beans. I have uh, grown 20 some odd different tomato plants, and I found out most of them I didn't like. My favorite is Big Beef, or Big Boy, uh, Early Girl. Those are indeterminates. They grow well, they grow cleanly, they produce a lot of food. My, my ultimate favorite is the Big Beef. So if I were to have to grow one tomato, we grow more Big Beefs than anything else because they produce more fruit than anything else. And they are beefy, beefy, beefy. So if you're looking for a nice, juicy, uh, seedy, Tomato, that's not it. If you're looking for a big, heavy, juiced, I mean, uh, thick tomato, beefy tomato, that's the tomato you want. Yes. Yeah, uh, remind me the difference between determinate and indeterminate. Okay. So the word bush, patio, or determinate are all the same thing. Uh, those mean that it's going to be a short plant and all the produce will come on at once within a three or four week period. That means the height is determined. An indeterminate plant, the height is not determined, and it will produce for months, years. An indeterminate tomato plant will produce for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years nonstop. Don't believe me? Type in uh, Disney World or Epcot Center tomato tree. They have uh, harvested over 34,000 tomatoes from one tomato plant. And the, the stalk is about this thick around, and they harvest it like an apple tree. It's grown up, and they've got it over a trellising system, they walk underneath and they harvest the tomatoes. So if you have, again, talking about the six laws of plant growth from the previous class, if you provide those, if you follow the six laws, you can grow anything anywhere. And an indeterminate plant will keep producing and a tomato plant for years. Uh, my tomato plants last year, as an experiment, I just let them get growing until I got tired of it. They were 21 feet long. Okay? So yes, uh, I like indeterminate. Let's talk about tomato plants. So down here on this sheet, if I'm gonna grow tomato bush plants, I'm gonna grow them 14 inches apart. I'm gonna plant them on the average day of last frost in two rows. I'm gonna plant them deep. When you get a tomato plant, those little fuzzy hairs on the side are root hairs. You want as many root hairs below the ground as possible. Plant it deep, dig a deep hole. Get those root hairs underneath there. The more roots you have in the ground, the more wa water you're gonna get. The more water you're gonna get, the more nutrients you're gonna get for that plant. The more nutrients and water you get for that plant, the healthier it's going to be, the more productive it's going to be. So we're going to plant those 14 inches apart in two rows. We're going to uh, harvest about 208 plant, uh, pounds, and we're going to use 52 plants to do that in. Conversely, if we're going to grow an indeterminate plant, we're going to plant uh, them nine inches apart in one row. 
We're going to uh, plant them deep. We're going to harvest 615 <coughs> pounds instead of 208 pounds. And we're going to uh, um, only use 41 plants instead of 52 plants. Okay? That's why I like to grow vertically. So look, look over this sheet here. This is a very valuable sheet that's in the Midlata Gardening course book. Uh, you can get this on midlatagardening.com. It is my gardening Bible. I didn't know anything about gardening, but if you are simply uh, smart enough to, to follow step one, step two, step three, step four, and not say, well, you know, I've been doing this for this, you know, my grandmother used to do it this way. She'd catch fish and she'd bury them underneath the corn. You know, we don't do that. If you're gonna follow the recipe, then follow the recipe. Yes. What about your tomato skins? I mean, I have a lot of them that are really tough and I have to throw the skin back into it. Isn't there some, I mean, some tomatoes have a thin skin that you can eat. Try the big beef. Does that have anything to do with the amount of water that it's given? It has to do a lot with the variety and the amount of water it gets and the nutrition value. Was there another question? Um, just a question on your beans, the whole beans. Are those like green beans that you eat the whole bean, or are those like the beans that you save and dry? And uh, it depends on the variety of whole bean that you grow. You, you can get both. Yes. So you can eat the, uh, the entire pod and the beans, or you can uh, take out the seeds. Yeah, right. shuck them. Depends on what you want. Yes. How how do you water and what do you do about droughts? Um, we covered that in the previous class. I don't have time to cover that oh. here. Okay. So that is in the Midland Gardening Course book. But to answer that question briefly, I water for 60 seconds a day, and I water directly at the root zone. We use about half the amount of water as drip irrigation, and I water as often as I need to if the plants are wilting. So when, you know, like today, when it's probably, what, probably mid-70s, I'm going to water once. If it was 100 degrees and my plants were wilting, I may water twice or three times, but for about 60 seconds. All right, so let's talk about how to build a garden at no cost. On these pictures, I guess I did it later, long years ago, and they did little boxes with um, sawdust and mid later and stuff. And these look like they're... You don't have to put the wood around the edge and you just kind of break it up into little pillars and two loads. That's exactly what we're talking about, yes. All right, so let's talk about the mid gardening method. Using four <coughs> sticks and two strings, how you can literally convert your, gar your grass into a garden. First thing is, and we're on the first step here, is you locate your place for your garden. This is very important. It has to do with the first law of plant growth, and that is light. Do not put your garden underneath your pine tree. Not because it won't grow because of the pine needle or the acidity lie of pine trees. It's because there's no light underneath it. Okay? Don't put it next to a wall where you're not going to get any sun. Don't plant it uh, on the north side of your house where you're not going to get any sun. Plant it where you're going to get lots of sun. So before we planted our garden, I went out and photographed every hour on the hour for months so I'd know where the shadows were in our property, and then that's how we decided where we were putting our garden. I grow food as if my life depends on it. I'm not gonna guess at it. Um, make sure you have a water source by your garden. If you don't have water, you're not gonna have a garden. Now, when they were in the third world countries or developing countries, some of the, some of the mid latter gardeners would walk two miles with two five gallon buckets to get water from dirty, gross water and bring it to the garden. Are you willing to do that? I bought property next to the Snake River. So I don't have to walk two miles. It's probably about a quarter mile or less and I can bring back buckets. I also have stored water and I also have a well. All right, so I, water is a very important. But it doesn't have to be potable water for you and me. It can just be the gray water or whatever. Um, if you want to minimize the weeds you're gonna have in your garden, don't use irrigation water. Um, make sure your ground is level in the growing area. Um, make sure you've removed all the rocks and the weeds. In our garden in Nido Falls, we had to take the rototiller. We had weeds up to our waist when we bought the property. We decided this is where we wanted to have the garden and never had a garden there. It was uh, fallow, what they call fallow land. And we took the rototiller, we set it two inches deep, not two and a half, 
and not an inch and a half. Two inches deep. Basically, we're scraping across the, the soil, getting rid of the, uh, and then we rake the, re the, the weeds off. Then we sifted the soil of weeds and rocks, and then we did it again. Until we had the majority of the weeds and rocks out. If we did it till all the rocks were out, we'd be in China, <laughs> all right? So, at some point, you just stop. Um, we cleared that, then we outlined the perimeter with stakes, saying, this is my garden, and then five feet in from that area is where we started the soil beds. So there is a five foot dead zone, okay? Now, right here is my lawn, lush, green, uh, moist, and the insects that are over there will not want to walk across the Sahara Desert over to my zucchini because there is nothing to hide. There is no shade. There is no water. There are, there's nothing here. There's this void, this no man zone here. And so that keeps the weeds out. That's my buffer. No, nothing grows here to here. No, that's it. And that's all the way around my garden. Um, I had to put in an electric fence to keep the raccoons out because in April, they were coming in, pushing over my corn because he was checking to see if it was going to be ripe. So uh, I put up an electric fence to keep them out. So if you have automatic sprinklers that go on at night, that's probably not a good choice. That's a really bad thing, yes. You will have mold and mildew and disease and weeds, am I right? Our, our, we have a lot of lawn that the sprinkles along our garden area, the sprinklers don't reach there. But I'm thinking if we want to turn our yard into more gardening space, then that's going to be an issue. Well, I took my sprinklers out of my lawn and I put in uh, watering, watering lines. Um, okay? When the sprinkler head came up, take that off, put on a, an adapter, put in a watering line. Number two is create a soil bed. Um, we take the, these stakes, and I've seen it with just sticks. You literally can use four sticks. Take some sticks or some stakes. You want them about 18 inches long, and you want them about 10 inches deep into the ground. So you've got about eight inches above the soil. Then you're gonna get some twine, um, uh, some rope, whatever it is, something to mark that. So, the outside edge of this stake and the outside edge of this stake is 18 inches apart, and you're going to run the twine down there. That's going to be the ridge. So not so the inside dimension is 12. The inside dimension at the bottom of the ridge. If you see my shirt here on this logo, the bottom of this ridge here is about 12 inches apart. So if you know if my ridges are going to be 18 inches apart, they're going to have slopes like the bottom of a mountain, right? And because of that curvature, they're going to, it's going to end up at about 12 inches where I'm growing. Tie the strings around the beds, level the beds off, moving the soil, so there is no more, in other words, less than one inch drop in 30 feet. This is very important. If I'm watering from this end of the garden and I've got a two foot drop in 30 feet, where's all the water and all the nutrients gonna go? If I have a two inch drop, all the water is gonna have so much flow, it will take all the nutrients with it. I like to keep my beds leveled 30 feet. To do that, it's very simple. It's in the Midlandic Gardening Course book. You take a two by three piece of lumber, make sure you're straight, not twisted, and all warped, like every piece of wood in Home Depot and Low is, all right? <laughs> go through the stacks, get a straight piece, go over and to the tool department, get a little line level that you would look, use, typically hook onto a line, you know, string, and, or sometimes called a string level and you just glue that in the center. <laughs> Put just a whole gob of, I like Gorilla brand glue, uh, uh, wood glue, and you just glue that on there. Now, when you go buy that little level <coughs> for a dollar and a half or whatever it is, right next to it will be a hundred dollar eight foot level. You just made a $99.97 level for $5. Jacob is trying to teach you how to do this on the cheap, all right? I've used mine for two and a half years now. I painted it so it doesn't warp and get twisted and it works great. 
Um, so you, you're gonna level that bed. Now this is important. You do not need to bring any dirt in from anywhere to level your bed. We were doing a demonstration in Lehigh and the lady had a 20 foot driveway and there was a nine and a half inch drop in her you know, driveway because they build houses up, right? From the street for drainage. So I, and I had a nine and a half foot drop I had to deal with in 20 feet. What did I do? I simply lowered this four and a half inches and I took the dirt from here and threw it down here. And it became level, right? That's all you have to do. Don't bring in dirt from anywhere else. Just within, within the strings, just move the dirt from the high spot to the low spot, and it'll become level. Do you have a picture? I do, it's what I did. Let me see. Make sure it's right. This is a beautiful picture. This is exactly what we're talking about. Can I pass this around? Now, it's important <coughs> to take the time to do this properly because once you've got this filled with full of plants and everything's growing and you've got the slope and you get your water running all the way down here, you're not gonna correct that problem because you, all your plants are in the way. So take the time to you do it. It takes me usually three or four times of moving dirt and checking the level, move the dirt, check the level, and then it comes out level. You will praise the day that you took the time to do that, all right? The next step is you want to add the nutrients to the soil. We talked about this in the last class. We want to put in the pre-plant mix, which is gonna precondition the soil. People ask, do you need to take a soil pH test? The answer is absolutely not. Doesn't make sense to do that. Um, I know where I live, if I, uh, because I have farmers all around me and they all do soil tests, they can tell me that in this corner of their acre, it's this pH. In this corner of the acre, it's another pH. Over here, it's another pH. It all varies within a range. Jacob Mitleider found out in 27 countries that the, the truth is if you have less than, uh, if you have 15 inches or, or I think it's at 18 in the book. Yeah. Uh, if you have eight, uh, 18 inches uh, or more of, Rain, then you need to use lime for uh, calcium. If you have uh, uh, 20 inches or more, you need uh, lime. If you have 18 inches or less of rain, then you want to use gypsum because it's pH balanced. It won't raise, it won't make your soil more alkaline. Gypsum comes from, what do you get that from? Gypsum, you can get at Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, IFA, Cal Ranch, and all gypsum is, is lime with sulfur. Because <coughs> lime will raise the pH, sulfur will lower the pH, and so it makes it a zero pH difference. All right, so you, pre, you, you apply the pre-plant uh, to your, your bed uh, after you make the ridges. When you make the ridge, how you make the ridges let me just check my slide here. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna sit back here. What you're gonna do is you've tilled that whole garden area two inches deep, you remove the rocks and the weeds, right? You put up your strings, you've marked the stakes where you're gonna grow. What you want to do next is take that tiller or your shovel and dig down eight inches deep to loosen up that soil in here. All right? because you want to grow, let your plant roots grow down. Now I'm growing rusted potatoes right now, and everybody knows you have to mound potatoes, right? Not if you prepared your soil properly and your plants are nice and thick. So I don't mound potatoes, they, the soil is nice and loose, so they just grow down into the, into the soil. If you have hard soil and you don't prepare it properly, then they're gonna grow up, because they can't grow down, right? Um, so dig this nice and loose, eight inches deep, now, we're, then we're gonna do is we're gonna pull the aisleways, this is very important, that you have a minimum of three and a half foot aisleway. We're gonna reach, uh, uh, I'm gonna stand here, and I'm gonna reach across the aisleway, and I'm gonna pull two inches of dirt from the aisleway in between the string here. And I'm gonna kinda make a ridge along that side, and I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. So now, I've got compacted dirt in my walkway, don't I? Because I've only tilled two inches deep in my walkway. So now I've got about a five inch rise above the walkway. 
and I'm going to make this. I'm just going to take this dirt and I'm going to flatten it out, and make a plateau. I'll make sure that's level, and then I'll take from the center of my row bed here, and I'll take half the dirt and I'll pull it here and make a ridge, and I'll pull over here and make a ridge. And now, remember that stake was 10 inches down in the ground and 80 inches above the ground. I now have made a four inch high ridge from the inside of the grow bed and it's six inches high from the walkway because this is two inches above the walkway. It's important to make the, the bed higher than the walkway because a month ago when it rained and rained and rained and rained, at least in Idaho, my walkways were flooded from end to end. My entire garden, every walkway, you could not see the walkway because it was flooded. It was like a lake. It looked like islands in my garden because all of my growing areas were didn't have any standing water in them because the water drained out into the walkway. Water finds its lowest level, right? And so even though the walkways were flooded, I lost no plants to drainage of problems. So that's how we build up the ridge. Um, again, this works. We, we, we till the, the, the growing area eight inches deep. And you never have to till the walkways again. Every year or whenever you plant new plants, you just simply dig down another eight. Uh, again, you're turning new soil, you're turning the pre-plant and the weekly feed back into the soil, and so that's when you're turning it back over eight inches deep. Relevel the beds. Um, make sure you've got your four inches ridges uh, there, and I would also recommend that you take your rake and you pack down the ridges to kind of firm them up. Then you're going to plant. How, how to plant and how far apart to plant is in that chart we already went over. Um, but space the seeds a, a, apart, keeping in mind how big the plant's gonna be at maturity, all right? That's a little tiny seed, so they can be really close, right? Well, no, because you're growing an, an avocado tree, right? So you, you gotta you know, make them apart appropriately. So, for corn, or for, for potatoes, it's eight inches apart, two rows, and alternating rows. For carrots, it's one inch apart. For onions, it's four rows instead of two rows. It's whatever, you know, just think about how big is this gonna be when it's at its maturity. So follow, all you need to do is follow the, the gar garden planning detail sheet in the book. Please do not follow the information on the back of your seed package. They are not growing food as if your life depends on it. Um, we, make a, we have a marker that you make in the book. Um, we take a two by two, and we, every six inches we drill a hole, and we put a, a, a half inch dowel in that hole. So we have every six inches we have a, a marker. On the other side of that two by two, we put a dowel every seven inches. And then if I'm gonna be planting, um, uh, let's say, a squash, which is 21 inches apart. I'll take that marker, which is eight feet long, I'll scrape it across that, that growing area, and so every mark I've got seven inches, right? What's three times seven? So I plant, put a plant right here, I go one, two, three, another plant, one, two, three, another plant, one, two, three. I'm not out there with a measuring stick or a twine or a grid, it just marks it really quick. So a 30 foot bed, I can mark it in four, you know, four swipes, probably 10 seconds and I'm done marking the bed. Really easy to mark. If you're gonna transplant, uh, what I recommend you do is plant 10%, if you're gonna be growing seedlings, plant 10% more than you plan on putting in the garden. Then take the healthiest ones and plant them and the, the, the other 10% or the part that didn't germinate, you don't worry about. So my, the reason why my corn is eight and a half feet tall in July, because it's supposed to be knee high by the 4th of July, right? Isn't that what it says? But it's this tall. It's because I planted 55 corn in my seedling tray. I wanted to plant 50 in the garden. I took the 50 healthiest and I threw the other five. So that's a 10% increase in cost, not a tenfold increase or fivefold like uh, one lady said, one for the raven, one for the crow, one for the worm, and one to grow, or something like that. I don't remember. She had some saying, she put five seeds in the hole. So that means her seed cost went up five times. 
Mine went up 10%. This is very important. I see um, this is a big mistake people don't know they're making, and it makes a, a, a lifelong effect on the plant. When you transplant a plant, make sure you apply nitrogen. This is absolutely critical. They are going to go into shock. Uh, you want to minimize that shock as much as you want them to, to uh, uh, be transplanted, and you're going to minimize that by giving them nitrogen. So All right? Is that, is that in pre, the pre-plant? This is separate. Yeah, so we have the pre-plant mix, we have the weekly feed, and then we have an application of nitrogen when we're transplanting. So when, I, when I'm transplant, what I'll do is I'll put the plants in, and then I'll give them one quarter ounce per linear foot after I've got them planted. I'll put it right down the center of this bed right here, and then I'm gonna water it in, all right? And uh, for the most part, you will never see a plant shock, ever. On our beets, they had severe plant shock. Um, don't know why, um, but they all came out of it. We did lose a single beet. Three days later, you couldn't have told, you couldn't tell you know, that we had just planted them. They looked great. Uh, again, transplant only your healthy seeds. Um, apply the nitrogen. Um, never, ever, ever, ever put dirt over your seed. Ever. Put sand. Um, if you're I don't know what your soil is like, but uh, if you wanted, if you put that seed down there, and uh, you wanted that dirt, and you get a crust in that dirt, that seed, that little tiny, those little leaves that kind of push up through the dirt, if they can't get through that dirt, you just lost that production, haven't you? No problem with sand. The sand would help hold the seed in place, but allow it to come up through the through the soil. So please. Is that the same way? Uh, seedlings, no, you can put them right in the dirt. Okay. But uh, seed that it has those, it's got one or two leaves, right, to push through that dirt. I was talking to a gentleman uh, in Texas. He said, I tried the mid-ladder method, and it didn't work at all. I said, that's too bad. Tell me about it. He says, yeah, I took my corn seed, and I pushed it down as far as I could, and I stumped in that dirt, and nothing came up. <laughs> I said, yep, you're right. That didn't work, but it wasn't the mid ladder method. And so we had a little discussion. I mean, he was texting, texting. I mean, he sounded like that. It was kind of fun. And uh, he was at the mid ladder gardening certification training this earlier this year, and he had 100% germination from his corn. All he had to do was look in the book. Oh, you're only supposed to plant it that deep? Okay. And you don't want to step on the soil? You put sand over it? 100% germination. Uh, when he followed the recipe, he goes, wow, this really worked. This guy, this Midlander guy is a smart guy. So if he's planting corn, and you go four times the width of the corn seed, so are you bringing in sand to put over it? I am bringing in sand. Yep, I have buckets of sand. Yep. That's part of my food storage is sand. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's mid-July, mm -hmm. and uh, most, I don't think anybody here is probably growing this way. Can we just Start right now. And you can absolutely start right now, today. And uh, what you're going to want to do is probably grow bush plants because you're going to, to you're going to be growing into October and November. And if you're growing bush plants, then you can make little mini A-frames and cover those with plastic and keep that cold weather and wind off of them. And that way you'll be able to extend your season another six weeks. Yes. Is it possible? Well, what we're talking about, the question is, is it possible to use this method? Uh, what we're talking about is the mid ladder method um, um, in general. Specifically, what we're talking, and, and the question is, can we use this method in a grow box? Specifically, what we're talking about here in this class is built growing in the soil, in the dirt, because the time will come when people won't be able to buy the wood, be able to get the sand, because they won't have transportation, they won't, storage won't be open, whatever the situation may be. But thank you for asking the question. Uh, Jacob found the productivity <coughs> in either sand, or soil, or either in a grow box or a soil bed is the same. So in his book, the first section of the book, part one, or excuse me, part two, is soil beds. Part three 
is grow boxes. So if you want to do this in a grow box, you just go, you just start in part three. And if you're going to grow in this dirt, start part two. And it is literally, I'll, I'll go to um, page 65. Oh, no, we're, we're doing soil beds here. I'll go to page 15. Planning. All I'm going to do is I'm going to read these six pages on planning. And then I'm going to, and it suggests what to plant and so forth. And then I'm going to go <coughs> into uh, the tools that I need, how much time it will take. And then I'm going to go into lesson two, preparing. And talk about clearing the area, eliminating the weeds. Uh, what, what about soil? How to build the ridges? It's all in this book. And then... What if it's clay soil? Is there anything you do about that? Do you have to replace it or anything? If it's clay, clay soil? Clay soil. The water just kind of... No, nope, I'm growing in clay soil right now in Idaho. It's not, and, and it doesn't hurt. It's growing great. But we always put sand over the seed. In the soil bed, it says step one, make a leveling device. Step two, check and move the soil. Step three, loosen and break up the soil. Okay, and if you can follow <coughs> step by step, it will absolutely work, okay? All right, we plant this plants, this is kind of unique, at, inside the ridges, at the base of the ridge, not on top of the ridge. Our aisle way is out here, three and a half feet wide. Our growing area is 18 inches wide, and we produce more food in 18 inches than people will produce in three feet beds. Right? Yes. And you always apply the fertilizer, whether it's the tree or the, or the wheat or the nitrogen, right down the middle. So we always apply all the nutrients right down the center. We want to apply the nutrients about four inches away or so from the plants. This is 12 inches wide. We're probably going to end up getting these plants in about two inches from that edge. That means now we're eight inches, and the center of that's going to be four inches. It works out perfectly. The reason why we want to have that soil, that the nutrients about four inches away, is because they are salts, okay, and uh, we don't want to burn the plant. But as we water it in, it'll dissolve it, and we won't have a problem. Uh, watering, uh, please don't ever sprinkle water in the morning. Um, oil. This is the, this is something I'm seeing in almost every garden. The soil is dry. If it's dry, you haven't watered long enough. So what I do in my garden is I use a garden hose with a rag tied on it. I, we've, we've worn out the rag already, so I get a bubbler. But anyway, um, it takes about four minutes for that water to get from one end to the other because it starts at one end and has to travel the whole 30 feet. And I wait till I get one inch of standing water at the end. When I have one inch of standing water, I turn off the water. And my soil has never dried out. Even when we were having 100 degree <coughs> weather, the soil never dried out. Do not let your soil dry out. Which place the bubbler? <coughs> and a bubbler, you know, if I, if I just had the garden hose sitting there, it would wash all the dirt away. Talking about a soaking hose? No, I'm talking a, re a regular garden hose with a little bulb on the end that has holes all the way around it. So the water comes and hits that. You can usually find it at the nurseries, okay? But uh, you don't have to buy that. I just get tired of replacing the rag because we were wearing it out. So you're just laying the hose on one end and then you just... Lay it on one end and just turn it on. And I'll just let the water, because it's level, right? The water will simply go down that row slowly and it waters the whole thing. On my... So there's not a deviation? Um, you always want to keep your, your soil wet. So if you have really sandy soil, you may have to water it twice a day. Look at your plants. If your plants are wilting, that tells you that they need water. Um, so in my potatoes, because my, my uh, rust potatoes are this tall, and I cannot see the soil bed. Um, they are, they're this wide, this, the, grow the soil bed's this wide, they're this wide in the aisleways, and they're as thick as a forest. And so there's so much growing in there, it, I can't get the water from one end to the other. So in that case, I have my, my hose with the rag on it, or the bubbler, and I walk down that row, because I can't get the water down. It. There's, so, there's so, many, so many potatoes in there, it just won't get down there. Yes? So I'm not always home. In fact, I was curious what you do for the three days you're here. What are you doing? Because you're not going to be there to be able to water 
every day as you're talking about? Are you just putting them on automatic timers or? <coughs> so I have um, four rows on automatic timers and I have five rows that we water by hand. And when you're Primarily, drawing? because as much as, as my garden is my garden, it's also a demonstration garden, so I want to show people how to do both. So uh, my daughter-in-law's parents are watering those five rows for us while we're gone. Right. And eating the raspberries, the tomatoes, <laughs> the beans. I said, you should eat really, really well this week. And so he told me he's harvesting raspberries, tomatoes, beans, what else was it? Lettuce. Uh, and so what he's doing, he's getting paid in kind for his time, and he's taking a long time to water the raspberries for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you could get the water, so you've got one inch of standing water in there. Yes. I have a question. Yes. Um, we, in Arizona, it gets up to 113, 115 yep. dB. And our um, squash plants, they wilt, but in the evening, when, yes. it, when the sun goes away, they come, the leaves. I grew up in Sierra Vista. Even though we haven't watered them, they will when it's super hot and then the leaves just perk back up at night when it's cooler. Mm -hmm. The sun's not beating on them. Mm -hmm. So is, does that mean that we need to water in the middle of the day at the hottest time? Or? So um, plants are a lot like you and me. So if you were out in that garden all day and you were wilty and thirsty and so forth, you wouldn't be very happy. When the sun went down and the heat went down, you kind of get your energy back, right? Yeah. Let me ask you, would you like to have some water during the day? Yes, I would. So would your plants. <laughs> uh, can I share some? I just moved from Arizona. And one thing I found was a lot of times, with a little help, you can make it through the winter easily. And instead of, like up here, you stop your planting, you stop your growing in the winter because the climate climate doesn't allow for it. Right. In Arizona, I just kind of flipped it. Yeah, the winter, the winter garden. And, and, and you have your, like a fall into the winter, and then you, you plant in the winter for the spring, and you winter. let the summer just yeah. <coughs> leave it alone and let it. Yeah. So what we did in cook. Houston is we got shade cloth. Oh. We made the little A, we're just following the Midlatic Garden course book, okay? We made the little A frames that shows how to do it. And instead of putting plastic over it to keep them warm, we put shade cloth over them to keep them from getting too hot. What, is, what do you use for shade cloth? Uh, it's called shade cloth. If you do a search for shade cloth, you'll find it. Um, but you can get it all over the internet. So just search for shade cloth. So it's uh, like a canopy that you put over, or is it closer to the ground? Well, it's up to you. You can do it at any height you want. So for <coughs> our bush plants, we just made these little A-frames. I'll show you a picture of my garden so you can see, okay? Um, and we just cut it to fit that that little mini A-frame. On my greenhouse, it's 20 feet wide and 40 feet long over my greenhouse. Over my bush plants out in the garden, it's you know five feet wide and just goes over the little A-frame. So it allows, uh, it cuts down 40% of the light, so it cools it, but still allows 60% of the light in. Okay. Right, because that will help reduce the stress of the heat. But if they need water, water. So when you're protecting plants from when it rains a lot, like in Arizona we get the monsoons when yep. it rains super, super hard, but then it dries really fast. Yep. Do we still need to protect them from that, those occasional monsoon rains? It's up to you, but I do. And that's why when I take the plastic off, I keep one side still buried under, under the dirt to hold it down. That way when I see the dark clouds in the south, you can just come my wife gets on one end of the plastic, I get on this end, we pull it over the mini A-frame, and I start going down and putting dirt over it, and we've got it covered before the rain never hits. In response to what she's saying, we've got to remember, the plants got to have air, too. Right. And they get their air through the roots. Right. So if you saturate, leave, you leave saturated too long, they're going to asphyxiate and <coughs> So you've got to have that right balance. I think that's why they're saying just an inch of water. And if, if you got it in three times a day in that soil, those conditions, fine. If you do it once, Fine. Right. Look, you just they're just doing eight inch increments just to kind of look keep at your plants. You and remember what we did. The first thing we did is we raised that growing area, didn't we? 
so you, it's really, really hard to overwater a midlatic garden because the water will find the lowest level, and if you get too much water, it will take care of itself. This is a this is the system; it all works together. You, I did not understand why it, uh, why I was doing things. I just took it on faith, and it all worked. And, and after I did it, I go, oh, that's why I did this. That's why. Oh, this makes sense. It all comes together. Uh, Feed accurately, you know, regularly. Uh, we went that, over that in the previous <coughs> class. It's very important. It's very inexpensive. We are growing our tomatoes using the Midlighter weekly feed for two cents a pound. That's our total fertilizer cost. And we're growing lots and lots of amazing tasting uh, uh, produce. Um, three weeks before you're going to harvest your single crop, you want to stop fertilizing. There's enough nutrients in the soil. You don't need to fertilize the day that you harvest. So if you're going to harvest a cabbage in three weeks, you stop fertilizing three weeks before then. If it's going to be pole beans, you're going to be harvesting for 16 weeks, and it maybe it's going into when it gets you know your first freeze, then you stop eight weeks before the, the first freeze of the you know, of the fall. All right. If uh, if you don't have the midnight of weekly feed and the new, um, pre plant fertilizer, you can use sterile compost or manure. Um, but there should be no reason why you don't have this. This is why we're at a preparedness fair. So get prepared, have this on hand. Personally, my wife and I have five years supply of all the ingredients we need to mix up our weekly feed and our pre plant fertilizer. I'm not, I mean, I'm prepared. That's bottom line. I'm not li li leaving it to chance. I don't know if this is going to be available next year. I personally don't know. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen to the economy of the world next year. So I, how, that's why I have. How much of that would you need for five years? Well, I have 20 packages of, of these, and I have 525 pounds of 16, 16, 16. And I have boxes of eight pounds of Epsom salts, and I have bags <coughs> of gypsum and so forth. And we built that up just like we built up our food storage. Uh, when my wife went to Sam's Club to go grocery shopping, she'd get, pick an extra box of Epsom salts and so forth. And as we just kind of build this up, so we have that and we keep that level there. Yes? Is that available locally? I don't have a computer access. It is, it, it, it is uh, available online at midlanticgardening.com. You may not have computer access, but I bet there's somebody that you know that has computer access. If your life depended on it, if I were going to pay you a million dollars to be able to buy this online, do you think you'd be a bigger way to do that? All we gotta do is just go to I have better time. That's you, what you, I want. Well, you can blend your own stuff. It's, it, blending is just a skill. You practice it and learn how to use your percentages and your okay. content and so on. So, yes, you can mix your own. So, you can get all the nutrients <coughs> yourself. So, in here we have uh, uh, iron. So, you'll buy iron. I just bought iron in a 50 pound bag, right? You will need about, what, two ounces of iron. You just bought a 50 pound bag. Heck yeah, I've lasted for years. <laughs> right. So you will pay thousands of dollars to build one of these. I know, because that's, that's exactly what I was thinking. I'll just do it myself. And so I had to have this great big bag of this. I only need this much. And then I had to have a great big bag of this and so forth. And so I just it's just cheaper for me to buy it online. Or you can split it. Yeah, I mean, if you're doing it commercially and you're growing and you know, you've got acres and acres, it, yeah. you may want to do that yourself. Get Absolutely. Some and split the bag, you know? Yep. Okay. So feeding accurately, control the weeds. You know what? The easiest way to control the weeds is you will not see me bending over weeding. We have what's called a two-way hoe, a stirrup hoe, a hula hoe. All right. It has a long handle on it. The best one I found, honestly, is from MintLineGardening.com. The one I bought at Home Depot is not even close to it. If you want to burn a lot of calories, really work your muscles, uh, get the one at Home Depot. If you want to do it quickly, easily, don't have to worry about sharpening it, have it last a long time, then get the one at home at, uh, at midlightofgardening.com. The difference is, is buying a good steel bladed knife or a cheap one that's on the checkout counter at Walmart, right? This one is going to be substantially more effective for when I need it, 
it keeps the edge and will do the job much much easier with much less effort. That's what that is. But keep the weeds at bay. The way that we do that is we weed early and often. It takes me about 10 minutes a week to weed my garden. That is a 55 and a half foot by 47 foot garden area and a 20 by 40 foot uh, greenhouse. So when I'm watering that row that, that takes that four minutes to water that row, I've already taken my scuffle hoe, walked up and down the aisles, and it's like a little vacuuming action. I'm just walking, and I'm just skimming the surface, just skimming it, and I'm just taking the heads off of the weeds. And remember, these weeds are this big, right? I don't wait till they're this big. I don't do repentant <laughs> weeding. I already did that when I cleared it. Why would I let it grow back up and have to redo that all again? So I already cleared it, and so, yeah, that's what my neighbor taught me when I moved. I said, I do repentance weeding. I said, what? Well, at least you're repenting, okay? But if you do the same thing over and over, I think it's called insanity. So just get rid of the weeds w once, chop them down, and then just, just once a week, just go through with a two-way hoe and keep those weeds under control. And uh, so before the water ever gets to the end of the row, I've already uh, weeded both aisles around that, that area. It takes very little effort. I don't even pick them up. Don't even bother picking them up because the next day you can't even see because they're all dried up and they're decomposing. So weed early and often. How do I take care of the bugs? I grow a healthy garden. That's honest. I, I grow a healthy garden. Now if I get a plant that's sick and I can't help it, I take that plant out of the garden because it's not healthy. All right? Um, animals, I have put up an electric fence. Uh, diseases, grow a healthy plant. So let me just show you my outside dirt garden. Uh, down here real quick, so you can see what I'm talking about. And then we need to be done. So this is my Idaho Falls terrible clay soil garden. No amendments, no compost, no tea, no uh, mulch, no manure, no straw, nothing. I'm going straight in the garden. Here's my mini A-frames, okay? I can put shade cloth over those, or I can put plastic over it, I can put bird netting over it, but, but these stay in the garden all the time. What's that made out of? Uh, Super cheap PVC pipe, it's right in the book, so easy to make. Um, 74 cents to make that. So that's what it looked like when we just got started in the beginning of the year. Let me show you what it looked like a couple weeks ago. This was it on uh, May 29th. We have already harvested that pumpkin, a nice big pumpkin. Our corn, as you can see, I had three plantings of corn. Uh, about three weeks apart, and I'm growing two different varieties because I've never grown corn before, ever. It is, I have 100% productivity from every hole. Every eight inches I have corn growing. Do you know why? I transplanted my corn. I didn't put the seed in the soil, I put a plant in the soil. I'm growing food as if my life depends on it. I want every hole <coughs> producing food. Uh, you can see the arches here. I had the plastic over it in the in <coughs> previous photo. I was able to plant the seedlings, the seeds in the tray in the kitchen counter in March. In April, I planted them outside, covered them. So when the hail came, the wind came, and the rain came, didn't bother them at all. Um, here's my, uh, here's my uh, rushed potatoes. This was before I had to build up uh, supports around them because they're literally this tall, this tall. Uh, here's our raspberries. We've now put uh, bird netting over the raspberries because the birds apparently like raspberries a lot. <laughs> uh, here's my shade cloth over my greenhouse. Okay, notice it's not all the way down to the ground. I'm still letting light through, and it's only 40% shade cloth. And so one other thing, over the plastic. yeah, just lay it over the plastic. And then the last thing is we're completely off grid. We're generating three times more power by solar than we're using in the house on the whole 2.3 acres. Everything we run, it runs off those solar panels and the batteries. So on your raspberries, it looks like you're ready. 
PVC drip line down the middle? That uh, happens to be uh, a concrete berm that the previous homeowner had built. So we're using that as one of the dirt ridges. And then on the inside, we built another ridge. And here, it takes about 20 minutes because uh, of how wide this is to water with the garden hose. So we, we're using the same thing, the same water garden hose with the bubbler on the end. And that's how we're watering down. You just chop up the road, the road, the road. Yep, that's all I do is move it down. That's how you do it. That's how you build a garden at no cost. Four sticks and two strings, and you can turn the lawn into a garden and be eating instead of, you know what? I spend more time, and I'm not kidding, it's frustrating, more time, more, way more water, and more expense on my lawn than I do my garden. Is that <laughs> nuts? But anyway, that's how we are. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.